My name's Tasha, and let me tell you about how my world used to be before everything flipped upside down. Back when life was just dad, mom, and me, we lived in a big old house with more rooms than I bothered to count. It was peaceful, you know, the kind of place where laughter filled the halls, and there was always some sweet smell wafting from the kitchen. Mom was the heart of our home. She'd wake up singing, her voice floating up the stairs. Tasha, rise and shine, sweetheart. I'd drag myself out of bed, grumbling like any teenager would, but her bright smile over pancakes made it worth it. Dad, he was the cool one. Always had a joke ready to lighten the mood or a story about his younger days. When I was your age, I thought I could conquer the world with just a guitar and a bad haircut, he'd say, and we'd laugh, knowing he'd done just fine with a business suit and a level head instead. Life was good. More than good, actually, it was perfect. But as they say, all good things have a way of ending too soon. When mom got sick, it was like our little paradise started to crumble. I remember the day she told us. We were sitting in the living room, the TV was on but no one was watching. I have some tough news, she said, her voice steady, but her eyes betraying her fear. Cancer. That word hit me like a ton of bricks. Dad reached for her hand, and they shared a look, a silent promise that they'd fight it together. The months that followed were rough. Hospitals, treatments, mom losing her hair, but not her spirit. She'd joke about saving money on shampoo, trying to make it easier on us. But I saw the tears she thought she hid, heard the worry in dad's whispers when he thought I was asleep. The day we lost her, everything changed. Dad and I, we tried to hold on to each other, to keep the pieces of our shattered family together. We'll get through this, Tasha. We have to, Dad would say, his voice rough, the bags under his eyes getting darker each day. A year later, Dad brought someone new into our home. Victoria. She was like a whirlwind, sweeping in with her perfect hair and sharp clothes, taking over everything Mom had left behind. The first time I met her, she looked me up and down, a smirk playing on her lips as if she'd already figured me out. She walked around, touching mom's things, rearranging the furniture. George tells me you're quite the student. I'm sure you won't mind helping out more around here, now that I'm taking care of things. I remember feeling my fists clench at my sides. Help out? This was my home, not some boot camp she could run. But for dad's sake, I bit my tongue. Sure, I can do more. Dad seemed to shrink a bit more each day, his laughter not as loud, his stories not as frequent. He was trying, though, for the sake of what he called moving forward. I wasn't so convinced. The new house was twice the size of our old one, and with that came twice the work. The first day we moved in, Victoria was already barking orders, her high heels clicking menacingly on the marble floor as she directed the movers. Once the movers left, she turned her gaze on me. Tasha, I expect you to take care of your own space. I won't have time to clean up after you. I was leaning against the doorframe, watching her. Got it, I muttered, already dreading the long list of chores I knew she'd pile on me and dinner should be ready by six each evening. I assume you can handle that? There was a challenge in her voice, like she doubted I could boil water without burning it. As the days turned into weeks, the house felt less like home and more like a fancy prison. Dad was out a lot, trying to keep his business afloat, which left me alone with Victoria and her endless list of demands. Tasha, the living room is dusty. Tasha, the silver isn't polished. Tasha, did you forget the dry cleaning? It was relentless. One afternoon, Dad finally noticed how tense things had become. He found me in the garden, pulling weeds with more force than needed. Hey, Tasha, you've been quiet lately. Everything okay? I threw a clump of weeds into the bin, wiping sweat off my brow. Just tired, Dad. This place is a lot to keep up with. He looked around, his expression growing thoughtful. Yeah, it's a lot for anyone. Maybe I can talk to Victoria, see if we can hire some help. I almost laughed. Good luck with that. She thinks I'm her personal maid. Dad's face hardened slightly, something I hadn't seen in a while. 
That's not what I intended when we moved here. I'll handle it, Tasha. You shouldn't have to carry all this weight. But despite his good intentions, conversations with Victoria seemed to go in one ear and out the other. She'd nod, smile that tight-lipped smile of hers, and then it was back to business as usual. Tasha, the hedges are overgrown. Tasha, the guest rooms need fresh linens. It was exhausting, trying to meet her standards. But it made me stubborn, too. I wasn't going to let her break me. I'd do the work, keep my head down, and count the days until I could leave for college. The thought of getting out, of finding my own space where no one could tell me how to mop a floor or when dinner should be on the table, that kept me going. But finally, the day came. I was off to a place where my stepmother's voice couldn't reach me, a city miles away where I could start fresh. I packed up early that morning, each suitcase feeling like a brick in the new foundation I was laying for myself. Dad came out to see me off, his face trying to smile, but I could tell he was torn up about it. Tasha, are you sure you've got everything you need? Dad asked, looking over the pile of bags and boxes. And you'll call if you need anything? Remember, the money for your rent and books, it'll be in your account. Check it when you get there. Dad, relax. I'll be fine. I'm just going to college, not Mars. I was trying to keep it light, to make this easier for him, but my own heart was hammering in my chest. The freedom of living alone was everything I thought it would be, and more. My apartment was small, but it was mine. No one to tell me to clean up, no one to report to, just my own space. My classes were tough, but I was tougher. I was determined to make the most out of this opportunity, studying hard and keeping my grades up. It wasn't long before I realized that living on a tight budget wasn't as easy as I'd thought it would be. Money was always on my mind. I didn't go out much, didn't see the point in blowing cash on parties when I had a goal in mind. Instead, I picked up a part-time job at a local cafe. It wasn't glamorous, but it was income, and every little bit helped. One evening, my coworker, Mike, caught me counting my tips for the third time. He leaned against the counter, a smirk on his face. What, you trying to make those bills multiply by staring at them? I rolled my eyes, shoving the cash into my wallet. Just making sure I got everything. Budgeting isn't exactly a thrill. Mike laughed, pulling off his apron as he prepared to close up. You know, you could ease up a bit. Come out with us tonight. We're just grabbing a drink to unwind. I hesitated. It was tempting, but sorry, I can't. Need to save every penny I earn. Maybe next time. I was here to build a future, one where I'd be financially stable enough to never have to rely on anyone, Victoria or otherwise. I wanted to save enough to buy dad something nice, something to show him how much I appreciated everything he'd done for me. Just when I thought I had my life at college figured out, everything started to unravel. It began with a call that I never saw coming, Victoria was on the other line, her voice cool and detached as she delivered the news that would turn my world upside down. Tasha, your father's hit a rough patch financially, she said without a hint of sympathy. We're tightening belts around here, and, unfortunately, this means we can't send you money for your rent anymore. The line went dead before I could protest further. I was stunned, the reality of my situation slowly setting in. No more money meant no more apartment on my own, no more safety net. I had to act fast. I explained my situation to Jenny, my college friend and classmate. She was as kind-hearted as they come, always ready to lend a hand or an ear, whichever you needed more. Tasha, that's awful. Look, why don't you move in with me? We could split the rent, and it'll be cheaper for both of us, she offered, while we were studying in the library. Moving in with Jenny was a breath of fresh air during a suffocating time. We shared costs, which made life somewhat more manageable, but just as I was adjusting to this new normal, another blow came six months later. Victoria messaged me on a social network this time. No more money for tuition either. Your father's situation hasn't improved. You need to stand on your own now. Reading those words, I felt a mix of anger and despair. 
My savings were meager at best, eaten away by bills and necessities. I tightened my budget even further, cutting down on everything non-essential, especially food. Meals became smaller, more about sustenance than enjoyment, and my clothes started hanging looser on my frame. One evening, Jenny knocked on my door, her arms laden with grocery bags. She must have noticed my weight loss. Hey, I picked up some extra stuff. Made too much dinner, too. You should come eat with us. I peeked out, seeing the warm light and smelling the food from the kitchen. My stomach growled, but I shook my head. Thanks, Jen, but I can't. I need to save every penny. I've got to pay for tuition somehow. Jenny frowned, setting her jaw stubbornly. Tasha, you need to eat. And you're not paying for this, okay? It's just leftovers. I wanted to argue, to maintain that thread of independence I was clinging to, but another growl from my stomach betrayed me. Okay, maybe just a little. Thanks, Jen. As the semester wore on, I threw myself into my studies with even more fervor, if that was possible. The only way out of this financial mess was through scholarships, and I wasn't about to let anything jeopardize that. Jenny often tried to coax me into taking breaks, coming to parties, or just hanging out with friends. Tasha, come on, you can't study all the time. Come out with us tonight. It'll be fun, and you need a break. I always had the same answer. I can't, Jen. I really need to ace these exams. But you're always working or studying. When do you ever relax? Jenny protested, her concern evident. Relaxing doesn't pay the bills, I replied curtly, my eyes never leaving my books. As the pressure mounted, my body began to feel the strain. Long hours at my jobs, followed by longer nights of studying left me exhausted, running on fumes. But I couldn't stop, not when I was so close to earning that scholarship, not when my entire future was on the line. The shift at the diner had dragged on forever, and by the time I clocked out, the sun was already painting the sky with streaks of orange and pink. Exhausted didn't even begin to cover how I felt, but classes waited for no one, and I had a midterm to prepare for. Dragging my feet to my apartment, I planned to grab a quick shower and head straight to campus. However, as I reached for my keys, a wave of dizziness washed over me. The world spun wildly, and the ground seemed to rush up to meet me. The last thing I remembered was the cold pavement against my cheek, then darkness. I woke up with a start, the sterile smell of antiseptic flooding my senses. Blinking against the harsh fluorescent lights, I found myself in a hospital bed, and four drip attached to my arm, and Jenny sitting by my side, her expression a mix of relief and worry. Tasha, you're awake. God, you scared me. I found you passed out outside your apartment, Jenny said, her voice shaky. You collapsed, Tasha. The doctor said you're severely malnourished and dehydrated. You've been pushing yourself too hard. You need to rest. Rest was a luxury I couldn't afford. Not now. Not with everything hanging by a thread. But arguing felt like running a marathon, and I didn't have the energy. After a couple of days under observation, I was discharged with strict instructions to take it easy. Instructions that might as well have been written in sand, for all the good they did. I headed straight home, my body weak, but my mind racing with all the things I needed to catch up on. Once home, I tried calling dad. I needed to hear his voice, to tell him what happened. Maybe, just maybe, he could help. But the calls went straight to voicemail. Frustrated and feeling more alone than ever, I dialed Victoria's number next. She picked up on the third ring. Yes? It's Tasha. I... I started, but the words tangled up, thick with emotions I couldn't control. Your father is out of the country. Business? She interrupted sharply. And before you ask, no, we can't help. You're on your own. Her words hit like a slap. But I... There's nothing more to discuss, Tasha. You're an adult. Handle it. The line went dead, leaving a ringing silence in its wake. I sat there, phone in hand, the weight of her dismissal, crushing. It was then, in that quiet apartment, 
that the reality of my situation truly sank in. I was alone. Utterly and completely. Exams were creeping up, looming over me like dark clouds, ready to burst. The stress was a tangible thing, wrapping its fingers around my throat, making it hard to breathe. To keep up with my studies, I had no choice but to let go of one of my jobs. Money, already a trickle, now felt like it had dried up to a few last drops. Sitting across from Jenny in the little diner we frequented, I fiddled with the edge of the menu, my stomach growling but my wallet painfully thin. Stop looking at the prices, Tasha. I've got this, okay? Jenny said, her voice firm but gentle. She was trying to be supportive, but accepting help never got easier. I'll pay you back. Every cent, I muttered, feeling the weight of each word. Jenny rolled her eyes, a smile tugging at her lips. Yeah, yeah. I know. Just order something hearty, alright? You look like you could use it. Reluctantly, I ordered the cheapest meal, my pride aching with every word. But Jenny was right, I needed the energy, especially now. As the exams rolled in, one after the other, I poured everything I had into them. Nights blurred into days, textbooks and notes scattered around me like a fortress. When the results came in, I couldn't believe my eyes, straight A's. A tuition bonus followed, a small but significant light at the end of a very dark tunnel. I should have been over the moon, but all I could do was collapse into bed, my body and mind shutting down from sheer exhaustion. I slept for days, missing calls and messages, the world moving on without me. One night, wrapped in the solitude of my small apartment, I dreamt of mom. She was in our old kitchen, humming a tune, her smile warm and inviting. Tasha, come here, sweetheart, she called, her voice a soft echo of better days. In my dream, I went to her, basking in the feeling of being home, being safe. But as dreams do, it ended, and I woke up in tears, the ache in my chest raw and fierce. The emptiness of the apartment was suffocating, and a desperate need to connect with her overwhelmed me. I made a decision then, one that felt like grasping at straws but necessary. I would go back to my hometown, visit her grave, and maybe, just maybe, find some of that peace I saw in my dream. Checking my bank account, I calculated what I could afford, a cheap bus ticket, the cheapest I could find. Work could do without me for a couple of days, I wasn't much used to them or anyone else in my current state anyway. Jen, I'm going home for a couple of days, I told her over the phone, my voice more steady than I felt. Home? There was a pause, and I could picture her brow furrowing in concern. Are you sure that's a good idea? Okay, but call me, alright? Anytime, day or night. Promise? Promise, I said, feeling a thread of warmth at her concern. The journey back was a blur, my thoughts a tangled mess of memories and what-ifs. As the bus rolled into the familiar streets of my hometown, a mixture of dread and longing settled in my stomach. It was supposed to be a simple visit, a moment to feel close to mom again, but as I walked among the familiar gravestones, a figure in the distance caught my eye. My heart skipped, tall, with a familiar stoop of the shoulders, kneeling by a grave. My pace quickened, disbelief and hope churning within me. Dad? My voice was tentative, almost afraid to shatter the fragile moment. The figure turned, and our eyes met. There was a flicker of confusion, then recognition, and something that looked a lot like sorrow. Tasha? His voice broke, raw with emotion. It had been so long. I ran to him, no longer caring about the cold or the tears that had started to spill over. Dad, what are you doing here? He rose quickly, nearly stumbling in his haste, and enveloped me in his arms. I was suddenly five years old again, safe and cherished. I, I had a dream about your mother, he confessed, pulling back just enough to see my face. She told me to come here today. I gasped, the parallel too stark to ignore. I had a dream about her, too. That's why I'm here. Dad wiped away my tears with an old handkerchief, rough and a bit frayed. Seems like she's still looking out for us, huh? Yeah, seems like it, I agreed, laughter mingling with my tears. We should talk, Tasha. Come back to the house with me, Dad suggested, his tone hopeful yet cautious. 
I hesitated, images of Victoria's cold stares flashing through my mind. Are you sure? What about Victoria? She'll manage. You're my daughter, and we have a lot to catch up on. His voice held a firmness I hadn't heard in a long time. The ride to the house was filled with an awkward yet comforting silence. When we arrived, Victoria was in the front yard, pruning roses with sharp snips that seemed to echo her mood. Tasha? What are you doing here? She stood up straight, her eyes narrowing as she took in my presence. I stepped forward, bolstered by Dad's presence. I came to see Dad. We have some things to talk about. Dad nodded at Victoria. Why don't you make us some dinner? We'll be inside. Her mouth tightened, but she nodded stiffly and headed inside. Dad led me into the living room, a space that once felt warm but now seemed curated for appearance rather than comfort. The tension in the dining room was thick enough to cut with a knife. Victoria, looking paler than usual, was fussing about leaving the house on some urgent errand, but Dad's voice stopped her cold. Sit down, we're not done here. Reluctantly, Victoria sat, her hands twisting nervously in her lap. Dad turned his attention to me, his brow furrowed in concern. Tasha, you've lost so much weight. Are you on some sort of diet? I shook my head, a bitter laugh escaping me. Diet? Hardly. It's not choice, Dad, it's necessity. I've been struggling to make ends meet because I've been paying for my tuition and all my living expenses by myself. His confusion was apparent. What are you talking about? I've been sending $3,000 every month to cover your expenses. It's been sent to your account on the 15th every month without fail. I stared at him, stunned. What? Dad, I haven't seen a dime of that money for the last two years. I've been working two jobs just to pay my bills and tuition. The color drained from Dad's face as he turned to Victoria. Is this true? Where's the money, Victoria? Victoria stood up abruptly, her chair scraping loudly against the floor. I, I needed it. It wasn't supposed to be permanent. Dad's voice was a low growl. Tell me everything. Now. She hesitated, then spilled the beans. I got involved in a financial pyramid scheme. I thought I could make a quick buck, turn around our financial woes, but I ended up in debt. The people I dealt with, they're not the kind you say no to. I used Tasha's money to pay them off. I thought I could replace it before anyone noticed. Dad's hands were shaking. You endangered my daughter's health, her education, over a get-rich-quick scam? And you hid this from me? I didn't know what to do, Victoria whimpered, her usual composure shattered. You're going to leave. Tonight, Dad said firmly, standing up. And we're done here. I want a divorce. After Victoria hurriedly packed some belongings and left, Dad turned to me, his eyes filled with sorrow. Tasha, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. From now on, I'll handle your finances directly. No more middlemen. I managed a small smile. Actually, Dad, I got a scholarship recently. Tuition's covered. His eyes lit up, pride overtaking the anger. That's my girl. Always making me proud. But you deserve a break. How about a vacation? A real one, by the sea. You've earned it. The vacation was like a dream. Blue skies, golden beaches, and the soothing sound of waves. It was a chance to recharge, to put the struggles and pain behind me. I returned with a renewed vigor, ready to tackle my studies with fresh enthusiasm. Now, back at school, I still worked part-time, not out of necessity, but to save up for something special, a gift for dad, a thank you for everything. Despite the hardships, the challenges, I found myself attending the occasional party with friends, allowing myself to enjoy life, not just endure it. I see you're going out more, Jenny noted one evening as I dressed up. Yeah, trying to find a balance. I guess I'm learning it's okay to have a little fun, I replied, adjusting my earrings. Just don't forget about us when you're famous, she joked, throwing a cushion at me. I won't. Could never. I laughed, feeling lighter than I had in years. 
As I looked at myself in the mirror, I saw a reflection of someone who'd been through a storm and emerged stronger. I was still careful with money, some habits are hard to shake, but now it was not out of desperation, but out of a desire to build a future I chose. A future that was finally looking bright.